Hi everyone, let's kick off Bio Digi Workbook 6. We're going to be talking about evolution today. We talked about these slides in class today, but if you need a refresh, come back and look at them again. For millions of years, amphibians dominated the Earth. They waddled and swam about in swamps of the Carboniferous period about 300 million years ago. Amphibians were not well adapted to land. Their skin is thin and can easily dry out. Their eggs are jelly-coated, like frog eggs, and their young develop like tadpoles. Amphibians have to stay close to water and can't take full advantage of the land. Eventually, new animals started to develop. They were stronger. They had dry, scaly skin. They laid eggs with waterproof shells. These animals were reptiles, and they were about to take over Earth. Dun-dun-dun. Uh, we're talking about dinosaurs, pretty much. So before we move on, you wrote in this box during class, but in case you missed it or if you want to add to your answer, amphibia is the smallest, least successful class of vertebrates. So here we have the development of a frog. And vertebrates are things with backbones, like vertebrae, spine. Amphibians are what we talked about above. So they have thin skin, they need to live near the water, they don't have scales. Um, so why is it that these are the least successful class, meaning... They are not the best at living to survive. There are also not that many different species within this category. So why do you think this is true? We wrote during class they couldn't live successfully on land. And they had jelly-coated eggs. Okay, that's all from the reading above. This means they had to live in limited environments, meaning they can't stray too far from water. And if you think about the jelly-coated eggs as opposed to a hard shell or even internal development like humans and other mammals, this is not a very well-adapted way to have an egg because it means your eggs are not very well-protected. Just like at the beginning of Finding Nemo, if it's a jelly-coated egg like a fish egg, it's not well-protected from its surroundings like a harder shell or, at best, internal development. What is evolution? Write your answer here. So our answers from class today, we have how living things change and adapt over time, how they evolve, how they develop, and I'm going to say how an organism, meaning a living thing, changes to best survive its environment over a long period of time. So I'm not just talking about one specific frog that learns how to be a frog really well. I'm talking about the species of frog for thousands and thousands of years, how they change to be better than their competitors or their predators, for example. That rhymed. So if we zoom in on these different pictures, this is obviously not a science example, but you can see over time, so from the early 1900s, Coke bottles look pretty different over a long period of time. So we're used to these plastic bottles. Sometimes we see these aluminum bottles. We still have the plastic. We still have the glass. But for a while in there, Coke bottles stayed pretty similar. You can see that these special edition bottles from 2007 look pretty different from the original bottle in 1902. Here's a very simplified diagram of how certain organisms have evolved. So you can see the closer they are at the end of the scales, they have more in common. So primates and rodents, again, not much in common besides being furry, but they both have internal fertilization and development, meaning they give birth to live young. There are no external eggs involved. Crocodiles and birds, for example, lay eggs with shells. And then down here, if you look, the difference between a shark and a fish, for example, sharks are mainly cartilage, fish have hardened bones, and then amphibians start to develop forelimbs. But again, different from the forelimbs on a primate. Over here, we have four different birds. These are types of finches, and you might remember Darwin's beaks of finches. He, We're going to get into his history in a little bit, but he studied different birds in the Galapagos and how they used their beaks in different ways to catch different food. So you might see here, bird number four and bird number one have very different beak sizes. They probably eat very different types of food or they eat it in a different way. So if bird one with its larger beak can crack bigger seeds and nuts, it might eat something similar to a sunflower seed, while bird number four has to eat something like just a tiny little poppy seed. So these two birds would not end up competing with each other. Bird two versus bird one 
or bird three versus bird four, you can see these two on the bottom are pretty similar. They might compete for the same food. These two up top, pretty similar to each other, might compete for the same food, but two and four might be okay together in the same environment, and one and three might be okay in the same environment. We will explore that more later. Who is Charles Darwin? Well, this guy, obviously, but why do we care about him? In 1831, Charles Darwin, a naturalist, boarded a British ship called the HMS Beagle, like the dog, a beagle. He collected samples and objects from each place he visited and took extensive notes on his observations. In South America, Darwin collected fossils of giant extinct armadillos. He noticed the fossils were very similar, but not exactly the same to the living armadillos in the area. So we're just going to look that up for a moment. Giant extinct armadillos. Fancy word, glyptodon. So these are artist drawings because as they are extinct, they no longer exist. But you can see here we have some sort of skeleton and shell set up. You can see what they kind of looked like. Some of these are artist projections of what they might look like. And if you look at a current armadillo, don't know if you know what that looks like off the top of your head, they still have this kind of shell. Looks like their shell maybe has changed. Maybe they've adapted to their surroundings a bit. Their faces look a little bit different than the artist's rendition, but it looks like it's similar to the giant ones that Darwin noticed the fossils of. So he drew some conclusions from that. He noticed the fossils were very similar but not exactly the same to the living armadillos in the area. Now again, Darwin was a naturalist which is kind of like a biologist but not as formally trained. It means he was studying nature and different species but he was not specifically a biologist. And he did almost all of his research just by taking really organized, meticulous notes. And this sounds very similar to someone we just learned about. So here's the challenge, and we answered this in class. Who came first, Darwin or Mendel? Remember Mendel was the guy with the peas, Austrian monk, farming them, dominant, recessive, big pea pod, little pea pod, all that stuff. And the answer is both. They were both doing their work around the mid 1800s, around 1850. And since there wasn't much in the way of communication technology, if they didn't know about the other existing, there wasn't really a whole internet for them to put their work on. So they did not know about each other's findings. But if you think about it, it would have been really helpful and probably would have moved the study of evolution and genetics along a lot faster if they had access to collaborate with each other on their work. Things could have been really different back in the day. Back to Darwin and the Galapagos. The Galapagos Islands are off the coast of Ecuador. So I'm going to show you on a map where we find the Galapagos. And we're going to tap back into our earth science memories for this. So you can see here we have the Galapagos, that tiny little island arc. It's an archipelago. Remember, a hot spot under the surface. As the crust moved, a bunch of mountains popped up and then eroded down into the islands we know today. But you can also see here we are off the coast of Ecuador. Ecuador is on the western side of South America, right below the equator. That's why Ecuador sounds like the word equator. And Darwin noticed that the species he found on the islands were very similar to species on the mainland over here in Ecuador, maybe in Colombia, maybe in Peru. And he figured out somehow the species that had been living over here on the mainland made their way to the island. And since it was an island, they kind of stayed where they were and they adapted to their surroundings in the Galapagos. Life over here on the mainland may have changed the animals and cities developed and some animals may have been driven out, maybe habitats were destroyed. But life on the islands, the islands are very limited in terms of population and they've kept them very well preserved for natural purposes. And there are tons of species that live in the Galapagos that don't live anywhere else. And so Darwin was able to figure this out and trace some of the history of those organisms back and draw some really important conclusions. So we're going to look at some pictures of the Galapagos too because it's beautiful. You can see it's a bunch of islands. It's pretty tropical, famous for this big old tortoise, much bigger than mainland tortoises. We have some seals or sea lions. We have this fun reptile, colorful crabs, 
What else do we have? There's some animals that are famous for being in the Galapagos. Um, there's some iguanas that dive into the water for like these. Most iguanas don't typically live by the sea. Um, and then the one that you guys all like the best, we have the red and blue footed boobies, which are a type of bird, look like this. So they have literal blue feet. And as a mating move to attract female blue footed boobies, the male does a special dance with his special blue feet. The beagle, which was the title of the ship, traveled to the Galapagos Islands and Darwin made some of his greatest observations there. He noticed that many of the island plants and animals were very similar, but not quite the same as the organisms in South America on the mainland. The descendant species, meaning the generations that had come from the original organism, always seemed to be able to do things better, like feed or fly or reproduce. And he called this descent with modification. And modification means change. So he's saying that the offspring of each generation have some changes different from the parents. And we learned all about how that happens during meiosis and then again with Mendel's inheritance traits. So we did this in class, but if you missed why we were doing this or if you would like to retry it, I'm going to give you the instructions again and we will do it in the video. So you're going to look around your apartment or house and find a handful of different small objects. So this can be erasers, paper clips, uncooked beans, if you have beads, crumpled piece of paper, a pen, Legos, hair ties, anything random that can kind of fit in the palm of your hand. You're going to put all of these little things, at least five, into a bowl or a box, bag, hat, or just on a surface that you're sitting near because you're going to pick them up and grab them. And we'll tell you exactly how and why. Here are the instructions, which I explain when I do it for you in my sample. You're going to reach into the container really quickly. You're going to grab the first three things you see or feel, and then you're going to move on to the next slide. Here's my sample for you. We did this today in class, but in case you weren't quite sure what we were trying to achieve, I'm going to redo it again for you now, and if you want to join along, you can. So, in class we said grab five random items, and we would take it from there. So I found this bag of random junk. I'm sure your house has one of these. This is probably in the drawer, maybe near the kitchen under the cabinet that's next to the fridge you know what i mean anyway find yours in your house so oh my gosh this is perfect this random bag of things has some ears from halloween a couple years ago which is just going to add to the whole predator thing because we are going to be a predator okay now i'm ready so i'm just gonna take that's convenient i have this little box of things i'm gonna put some random things in here so i have some Store rewards cards, a screw, a couple binder clips, rubber bands are good for this, paper clips, um, oh, a nickel, and I'll do one big marker, okay? So my box has a random sampling of items, household stuff. So I'm gonna reach into the box, and you can do this with looking or you can do this without looking. I'm gonna grab the first three things that either I see or touch, okay? So without looking, I'm gonna go for one. The pen was the first thing I got. Then I'm gonna fill around and grab what I see. I got this, whoa, oh, it fell through the cracks. It was one of these. And then I'm gonna grab the third. First thing I see is this um, grocery store reward card, okay? So the three items I grabbed, the pen, red, it was also taking up most of the box, really easy to grab, kind of in the way of the others. The card was also a big part of the box. It was on top, it was hiding the other card that was in there. And this clip had some parts that were easy to grab but I'm more interested in the things that I didn't pick up. So I didn't even see this rubber band. It was kind of bunched up at the bottom. It was small, it was hidden among the other things. The nickel, even if I had seen it, it was really hard to pick up. You can't even see it in the box. It's really hard to pick up because you know how when a coin is on a flat surface, you can't really grab it. And then this, everything's falling through the cracks in this table. The screw, hang on, the screw, Again, it's clear, this part was kind of hard to see, and then I didn't want to grab something sharp really fast. So those are some reasons why I wouldn't have grabbed those items. So we're gonna analyze this just like you guys did for homework last night. Let's analyze what we caught. So you can write your own answers for this one. I'm gonna write the answers to the things that I just grabbed out of the little box I was using. And you might already have these answers from earlier because this is tonight's homework, and you might have already done this in class. So the three objects I grabbed were the red marker, the grocery card, and the binder clip. 
What do I observe about the prey? So the red marker was large and bright. It was kind of in the way of the other things. It was really easy to grab. The card was on top of a bunch of other things. And again, it was big, easy to grab. It was kind of sticking up. And then the binder clip, that was that little black thing, was also easy to see. And the silver parts were sticking in the air, so it was really easy to grab. So I'm going to say easy to grab. And what do all of the objects that I caught have in common? So the marker was large and bright, so that made it easy to grab. The card was on top, which made it easy to grab. And the binder clip had the sticky up part, which was easy, easy to grab. So here we go. All of my items were easy to grab. And yours might be a little bit different. Maybe you chose something that maybe you did it with your eyes shut and you found the biggest thing in the box. Maybe you were looking and you picked the thing that had the brightest color or was the shiniest. It totally depends on you. And this is a little hard to read, so I'm going to change my font color as I type. What did I overlook as the predator? So remember, if you overlook something, it means you didn't pick it up, you didn't pick it. So what things didn't you grab? So I said I didn't grab the um, bunched up rubber band. I didn't grab the screw. I didn't grab the nickel. I had a bunch of different things in my little box. Um, I, didn't grab the, I didn't grab the other card. Um, so you don't have to write everything you didn't grab. And why didn't I catch those items as the predator? Um, the rubber band was hidden. The screw was kind of sharp. It also blended in with the background of the box. It was about the same color as the box. Uh, the nickel was in the corner and it was hidden. Also hard to pick up. The other card was under the one I did grab. So again, the things I didn't go for were either harder to get to harder to see, or harder to pick up. Now, how does this activity relate to a real predator-prey interaction in the wild? So let's say you have a coyote going after a chicken, just like in the movie we watched during honors. So chickens can't fly. In the movie, they happen to all be in the same little coop area, so there were a lot of chickens per square foot of coop. And a coyote has pretty good senses. They're pretty fast. They have a great sense of smell because they are in the dog family. So the chicken really isn't a match for the coyote. So just like me grabbing the easiest things to get in the wild, a real predator typically goes for prey that might be smaller, slower, not as clever, for example. Like a chicken is not about to outsmart a coyote, but a coyote might figure out how to get into the chicken coop. These are just some examples. Now let's say you are thinking from the perspective of the prey, if you are a cactus and you're about to get eaten, you have spiky protective spines on your surface. So maybe you have spikes, like thorns on a rose bush. Maybe you have quills, like a porcupine. That's another version of spikes. Maybe you can zigzag while you run, like a rabbit. It kind of hops and zigzags its way. It's also pretty fast. Maybe you're faster than your predator, and maybe you blend into your surroundings. We learned in Olympic when we did some of those games that the less you moved and the more you could hide in the bushes, the less likely you were to get caught during the game. So I will change these colors so you can read this a little bit better and then add to any of your answers if you need to. This week we're going to talk about a number of different ways that predator and prey can survive in the same environment. But just remember, the predator is trying to catch the prey, and the prey is trying to defend itself somehow against the predator. Your next slide for homework is what do rabbits, squirrels, ham and hamsters, and other rodents typically eat? And here we have some examples. Things like leaves, maybe carrots maybe other fruits and vegetables. The shorter answer is plants. All of the animals above are rodents, and rodents are typically herbivores. An herbivore is animal that, that only eats plants. What do city rats eat? Ooh, I think you might all recognize this one. In class, we're gonna talk about this, but pizza, wires, garbage, anything they can find. They're not exactly picky. They're not exactly Remy from Ratatouille. And 
Why do they eat what they eat? Well, it comes down to one word, adaptation. If you're a rat living in the city, you're gonna find ways to keep yourself fed based on what is available. So you're going to adapt to your surroundings. If you can't survive in your surroundings, you have to make a change that will allow you to do so. Adaptation is a change in structure, meaning the body shape or behavior, so how you act, you being an animal in this case, to suit a particular environment. So go ahead and find the parrot in this slide. It's really hard, I'll give you a hint. It's probably green. You're gonna drag this arrow somewhere to find the parrot. When you finish finding the parrot, you're going to move on to this forest. Find the wolf, drag the arrow to it. Good luck. Again, you can drag this arrow wherever you find the wolf. Here we have another one. Find the leopard, drag the arrow to it. Good luck. And a challenge question. List two ways that an animal can adapt, and you can answer them in the arrow here. So remember, adaptation is a change in your structure, which is your physical setup, or your behavior, so how you act in a certain environment to suit that particular environment. So two ways that an organism can do this. And you have finished lesson one. We will explain your next assignment later. Good night.